The endless crickets. Please stop. Interrupting the current corona cricketism to bring you behind the woodshed. This is the Cricketude Busting Episode, BTWRLM374. It is coming to the point now, we've been doing this for long enough, if you just put those numbers in, the broadcasts sort of percol up, percolate up through the search engines fairly well. I've been finding, I do some, re like I said, I do my own research on my own broadcast. What did I say back when? And I thought I'd covered that and I need some of the information myself. And sometimes I can find it that way. So that's why, and thanks again to Vince who allowed, who offered that. I, I believe this is, we've been doing this now for a little while. Uh, what was it? Episode, we calculated 156. So that's what the numbers were about so that people can get back to the information. Uh, and I'm really not that formal on how we do this, but... Uh, there at BTWRLM374, we're going to give referencing, you go to the blogcast to get all the links. And remember, instead of bloodshed, bring them behind a woodshed. And I'm saying this very particularly, what's going on in, in Seattle. I guess people will have different ideas. And yeah, it's pretty macho to hear what the confrontation might be. And it's really interesting how the gangs can drop all pretenses and all of a sudden get together. We should be doing that across the board, actually, but... Uh, I wonder if there's a pool going on to what's going to turn up in Seattle. My my look at that, my opinion on that, is the people that are going to stand up for America and say America's open to go open up Chaz, they need to really look, take a step back if they're so tactically oriented and strategically oriented and understand that they're walking into a condition that the people who allowed it are stepped back. And that step those step back people are the ones that you really should be concerned concerned about and alter or abolish them once you set the record for their maladministration. What do I get? Why do I bring up these things in these particular words? They're written somewhere. They're black and white. They're not an opinion. And where did I get that? Uh, the Virginia Constitution. And how did I find out when I got finally got into what? The Boogaloo Bugaloo, Bugaboo and the sanctuary cities and I said no they're not sanctuaries for gun control that's not what you want to do what you want to do is find out find the maladministration in that the government has done and where did I find that in their constitution in Virginia and I said we can use this as a model so all this stuff that's going down that we predict civil war and all this I look back and say boy there's some puppet puppeteers out there really pulling this together and these people are falling right into it and I've, I've been an advocate of no jeopardy and evolutionary, evolutionary engagement. We have to evolve with the condition we find on the ground. And don't be playing into these, these conditions. Yeah, it's all macho and everything to hear all this stuff going on. But we're, we're really in a different time. We're a diff different time. And my uh, thought on all this has been, and we have had good results where we can get people to move forward with it is to make a record as you move and you make the record definitive you never bring an argument in fact that's been been a very big problem trying to for me working with my colleagues making sure that you don't start the journey in a question you never bring up a question you never ask when you see the black and white declaring the condition already in law no question no interpretation no opinion needed and a duty and obligation tied to that you go there. You don't ask anybody for their review as we was talking about how we're going to approach a problem. I'll be getting to it in this broadcast relative to a decision that was made in one of the courts. So anyway, there's a whole different way what I talked behind the woodshed here on how to approach what I believe we need to approach. We come from a foundation of law, whether or not that's recognized. We prove that it will either not be recognized or it will readily be recognized. When you prove it isn't being recognized, now you have your your record made for maladministration at any level. It doesn't have to be as large a problem as we see this medical martial law nonsense coming on. And now the twist, because I told you they ran out of stuff. They ran out of flu, right? It's not flu season no more. Now they're going to turn the picture over on you. And I said that's going really, to that's gonna help to close that window on all the remedies, which I believe is going to, I, I still believe it, I still see it. I'll be able to speak to that again more and more. This is, for each one of us, the habeas corpus. That's the only way to remove the restraint on liberty. And you know, people are, a couple of you got it, but and I'm working toward it, but most I don't see most everybody doing anything. So I'll actually have a couple of examples. They won't be 
applicable directly, but they'll give you, if some of the people that want to see forms, I'll be able to have you uh, have a link that will show you what other people have done relative to the writ of habeas corpus, which is the writ the judge signs. It's a def the document, the writ petition has a couple of component parts. You'll see that when you read your state's habeas corpus guidelines on how to present it. There's a, there's a complaint and then there's the writ. The writ is the one that the judge signed. Now, we'll give you some examples, but remember they have to be conformed to your local jurisdiction. And before you even get there, you have to get to the point I've been telling you of understanding how the fraud and ultimately treason is perpetrated to restrain your liberty. And I think that that restraint of your liberty can be quite expensive if you think about it just a little bit. We don't get all constitutional about it, all about constitutional rights are being stepped on. You show relative to the right being violated irreparably and without warrant. And when you go after this thing, I've been telling you, when you really, I just don't get people, I don't see people truly understanding this idea, this fact. There is no test. It, this is such a powerful point about the failure, being able to point out the failure. Now, you can't just say there is no test. You have to build the line items, which gets you there. But when ultimately, there would be no test that a local authority could do in order to make the certifications. And you'll notice that most, I haven't found one yet. There is no certifications, which were required. There's your maladministration. There's the feasances, the nonfeasances, the malfeasances, or the nonfeasance, not doing something that they ought to do. These are just words. You go out and find out what they mean. You can put them together. It's not that really that hard. But let me move on to move from this real quickly and then back into these things that I've been talking about just to move this idea that the habeas is there. It's being used. It's not suspended. In fact, I've got a court case right now where it was suspended in one case and not suspended in the other. But when you hear about when it was suspended, you're going to wonder why, how they have the authority to do that. And then it's a matter of are you looking at the process right? So there's always these details to look at, as I call knowing the battlefield, knowing how a battle it's kind of learning uh, chess when you learn chess and you learn gambits to be able to play forward of somebody. If you learn all the moves ahead of time, you, you don't have to worry about making those moves. It's kind of like practicing in emergencies. If you practice enough, then your body just goes through the motions when it sees the problem. And it works a lot quicker that way. But anyway, going here, let me move into this. Things I've told you about in the news is notice to us. If those of you that didn't understand how to move something forward relative to your health, and if you're in a metropolitan area, or maybe not anymore, they're pretty well extensive now where they fluoride the, uh, fluoridate the water. Here is a historical court case coming that you can watch or you can, well, this lady's coming way out of, there's a lady coming way out of the east to, to do something in the, in the west uh, to fight for the, the uh, expose, a court case that exposes the prop, propriety of fluoridation. I want you to see in the no, notice to us, they're actually dealing over administrative failures, not that there's a, a an absolute right here. When you when you finally understand what will happen, this is going to expose that the, well, if it does, if it's properly advocated, it will expose that the EPA didn't actually look at, if you will, take that hard look enough. And so this would be a guidance for people who are trying to do other things in other health areas that the government has agencies over relative to baby 5G. Not the facts of this case are applicable, but the, pro the techniques, the evidences they need relative to the subject matter. This is all instructive for any of you that really don't quite know, have a have a passion to go after it, but don't quite know where to start. Like a couple, quite a few people say, well, what, I don't understand this habeas. You just start to read about habeas corpus. Go read what they what they're about. Understand, essentially, it breaks down to an, an unwarranted restraint on your liberty, and this is a remedy in order to at least inquire upon it. And you'll see this is very historic. There's cases way up in the beginning of the nation that people were held uh, held underneath this, and they, they use this remedy in the, in the Constitution. Don't give lip service to your Constitution. Don't say it doesn't work. Show me where you've exercised it. And where you've used ex exercise it and you properly put your, your case forward, and then it's denied, now you have an administration potential. So you have to do the first thing, because we've heard in the Wisconsin case, they're waiting for you to come and make sure, ensure, they said, ensure the government hasn't worked beyond its its authority. And to me, the only, again, that getting over quickly to, over to the COVID-19 disease, not the infectious agent, 
that we're dealing with uncovering the fraud. And fraud vitiates every order. And so that's why I went there quick, because of the type of subject matter authority they were going to invoke. And I did this how many years, how many months ago now? I've been doing it the whole time, but in particular to the one subject matter of this martial law uh, imposition that kind of slow motion came on everybody. Oh, now you see it. Oh, the tanks are in the street, but no one responds. Really amazing to me. And then some of you do are trying, and some of you are just still baffled. You want to, but all I can tell you about, go read the re about the remedies wherever you can find information on it. Don't take the first thing you see. Start reading to the extent. Go read some court cases. you gotta, you got to tune up your tools about how you're going to go through this. If you haven't ever been exposed to it, that's where the government wanted you. That's why you weren't, in fact, there was in the chat, we were talking that you know, somebody as advocates, the, the little ones need to be taught remedy in school. Yeah, but they don't teach you for a reason. And that's the problem. And so when you find yourself not understanding how to do something that is, when you hear the court so-called are saying that that's what they require you come in and you've never been told about that, you're looking at a long-term plan against you. That's not an excuse not to act. You have to figure out the limitations in your problems, educate yourself, find people that can help explain things to you, and move with your best, your best, um, what can I say, your best options at the time. It may not be perfect, but you, you do have to move. And, and like I said, this habeas is, when they moved it on over into, so, into what you're seeing, the riots in the streets, that's pretty well called the end of your time. And it's going to be a matter of time of when each state rolls out of their their lockdown of you. You voluntarily allowed. And you voluntarily allowed it and they thought it was, they think it's right because your remedy, they know your remedy of habeas corpus sits there is the other insidious part about all this. So we can sit back and do nothing. We can do whatever, have our thoughts in our head about what we think is supposed to go on. We can rail against the we can rail against government, we can rail against it, uh, lots of things until we take a step in the right more right direction. We're not going to test the parameters of that. And then I, as I say today, we need to do that in mass so we get the universal response because I don't think it's going to be a good response for us. We have to be patient enough to watch that failure again. Now that gives us the basis to say, okay, it's done. You're not even following the basics of the establishment. That's why it's been all messed up. That's why the cancerous infrastructure for the globalism globalize, uh, globalism is in there. That's why all these usurpers inside the system, the cancerous, oh, there's a bunch of different cancers. That's how you got in there. And it becomes the people were derelict to essentially be educated, masses, and vigilant. Oh, they're vigilant to run over and boot the people out of Chaz because it makes them tough. But they're not going to do it before they had to do that, and that's the thing. I I just don't get. I don't get that. You know, I guess I'd have to talk long and hard with people to figure out how you explain to me how that was. How this answer after the fact was better than the one you could have done before the fact. Here we go. Let's get on. A historical court case. The fluoride cover-up will soon be exposed. I would hope so. In the title, just reading it for your edification here that it's going on. Somebody stepped up. Actually, quite a few people. And I'm hoping this is not a stocking horse, as I've explained all that, and the stakeholders. I hope this is not that. I hope we get some actual looking at whether or not it was proper for the EPA to bring a, neuro a neurotoxic substance into your world underneath the imposition of a dentist, of all people, as I read here. The, four, but anyway, go, the first paragraph at least says, for the, for the last four years, attorneys to Florida, fluoride, excuse me, fluoride action network, have uh, been fighting a legal battle against the United States Environmental Protection Agency over whether water fluoridation violates the Toxic Substances Control Act, TSCA. And I want to point this out because they found a black and white code that offered a remedy, and they're exploiting that. Okay, but otherwise, you, the, otherwise Title 50 would run on this, and you wouldn't have this access. And this is why you need to get back in, uh, the vigilant masses need to get back in, and where you're finding violations you need regula uh, code, actually, eventually, to conform the legislative, the executive agencies to implement the code correctly. And the, and the environmentalists have taken great utility in in actually abusing things like this as well, especially in the Clean Water Act. And this is like what early on it was our main fight in the miners. Somehow I've been able, and I think I did, I was the only one actually arguing 
they were uh, they were using the Clean Water Act against miners. They don't do that anymore. Again, it was that evolutionary engagement. We didn't allow it, but we didn't. We went in and we made a pain uh, to have them prosecute the miners. They don't do that anymore to us. And that was a self-defense response, even against the awesome power of the federal government handing environmental groups using stake, stalking horses to destroy production. And so we're going one more one more para- sentence here in the last in the first paragraph. A recent ruling by the judge in the case now set the stage for a federal trial, which will include three international experts of neurotoxicity testifying on the dangers of water fluoridation. They had to get that in as well. Uh, I, I pointed out to you, even in this COVID, there was a woman that stepped up and said, I'll go wherever I need to go to explain the doctor that explains, and I don't know if her name is Cahill. Uh, excuse me if I got that wrong, but you'll find in my past broadcast, the, the broadcaster, that she said internationally she'll come in and discuss this. Now, that would be a request in the court by the process to bring an expert in who would, uh, if you needed to, talk about what that part she was going to say, which was going to blow the lid after after one part of it. And so when you look at what you need to do, this notice here about this case explains to you what's available to you and that there's something that you need to do as well. Whether this is the only option, I don't know. But for everybody that complains about fluoride, fluoridated water, or anything, or 5G, or any of this other stuff, stop complaining. Here's what you start utilizing to move forward and start taking that wrong that you believe is wrong and make it right. It takes a little bit of work. You've got to prove your case. It's not my rules. It's just what the way it's set up right now. And again, we have lo- we have not really enjoyed these so-called constitutional rights, as I was also talking to chat, when there's a granted right sitting there that's imposed by a mischaracterization by the government, that's got a couple of remedies. You have to know them, but you're ignorant of those remedies, and so now you feel that you're out of place and you don't want to start something you don't understand. I understand all that, but that's not an excuse. If you're not defending against that imposition, that infringement, you're just like any prisoner. It's not about being combative. I don't work in the, I don't be, like I said, I'm not working in argument. There is a written black and white thing that you do turn to. There's a written obligation and duty that you can find that says it's not supposed to be infringed by the party who does the, the infringement. And that brings you into your cause with the harm that you identify. That's your case. That's how it works. So for those of you in the, in the news about, in the know, in the understanding about the fluoride, there's a case now. Somebody, I just wanted to point out, somebody from the Middle East, I guess Michigan or whatever, Wisconsin, she's in the she's in the case. Green Bay mother is a plaintiff in the federal trial on fluoridated water to start today, which was uh, in June 8th, a couple days ago, uh, quite a few days ago now. So, anyway, just want to let you know, this is it. You don't have to be in any particular place as long as you are motivated and move forward. I hope these attorneys are good, uh, are good attorneys. I hope they bring it forward properly. And then we're going to get this again. It's if it's a bad thing, we need it out. If it's an adv- advantageous thing, then I don't know how we would keep it out. And that hasn't been des- decided correctly. It's been decided underneath the license given to the the deference that's given to the administ- the ag- executive agency, who we're going to find out in a court case decision just happened uh, that that's a very powerful thing that the government has that you have to defeat outright. What I've been saying, what we've been working on, and relative to the, again, this this COVID nonsense. Another thing coming on about now moving into that, moving toward that decision, those discussions and things coming up about this that you're living in, they've locked you all down and no one knows how to stop it. But I've told you across the country, nobody's challenging the validity of these orders. And uh, so we got a couple of people, I do no research, doing research that may be able to bring that forward. We're going to have to see this. And anyway, Lancet has made one of the biggest contra- uh, retractions in modern history. How could this happen? The last Lancet is one of the oldest and most respected. Who makes that respect, folks? One of the most respected medical journals in the world. Recently, they published an article on COVID patients receiving hydro- hydroxychloroquine with a dire conclusion. The drug increases heartbeat irregularities and decreases hospital survival rates. This result was treated as authoritative and major drug trials were immediately halted because why treat anyone with an unsafe drug? Now the Lancet study 
has been retracted, withdrawn from the literature entirely at the request of three of its authors who can no longer vouch for the veracity of the primary data sources. Given the seriousness of the topic and the consequences of the paper, this is one of the most consequential retractions in modern history. And so this points us not just that there was a retraction and, oh, look at the medical profession and their experts say and all that. This is a report, if you needed it, you can show how, and I, again, relate it all to your local power, not the government, you, in asserting that the local power failed. It was derelict in its obligations and duties. When you see this study and you see the question on authoritative, they're treated as authoritative, then you see that the guidance that was taken from them, if there was any, is, wasn't to be relied upon. And I focus your attention then on your due process that was required for the local authority to make a proper assessment by the facts on the ground, not take guidances which you now can prove are not authoritative at all. And then you got to add the one element, how they should have known that that was not reliable, and you can kind of combine the fact that there would be no certification when they looked on the ground. And so, again, it takes a little bit of compiling the, the facts together to comply and comport with what a judge would try to do or try to consider to do to evade your point. That is kind of an esoteric subject matter, which more likely is best answered when you get involved. Like I tell you, once you get involved, and we get if I ever have a chance to get in a discussion, if it doesn't quite come proper, if there's not an opportunity to understand and I have an opportunity to explain, that would be more of a discussion relative to how you would prosecute that and, and protect against it. And this is what's also not going on. Nobody's protecting the, the cases that run across the nation, no one's protecting against the deference that the court itself has in its orders because of its establishment, let alone the deference it it hands over to the executive because it's in a better position to determine. That's what I'm talking about. It's not in a better position to determine where it evaded all of the obligations and duties upon it to do the things that it was supposed to do to verify factually that there was some... Essentially, it's the the infectious agent. Now, if you heard what I, if you just heard what I just said there, now you understand the power. If there that there is no test, there could be no reports. So there's nothing they could rely upon, and all these authoritarian the authority things relative to treatment are actually second place anyway. So, you have to, again, these are all just evidences that the so-called authorities that you hear the government relying on are not. And this is becoming more and more apparent. The CDC is not an authority. It's merely an agency that offers uh, guidelines and suggestions. No different than, and even less in the in the WHO, the WHO, the, not the rock group or, or the OWL, the, the World Health Organization. They just offer suggestions on the international side. Nothing on any of the CDC so-called authority, the FDA so-called authority, or the WHO so-called authority, can circumvent the local state obligations and duties to find factual, truthful, demonstrable exigency, any anyone. And so here we have the authorities are not authorities. They can be retracted. This one is such a pervasive um, retraction. It literally is a historic retraction. It's it encompassed the the globe as far as its effect, and it may have very well killed people to be in the loop of the authoritative part. No one peer-reviewed the article before it even got published. And if you notice, we were running a lot on people that were just throwing in articles. And so you, when you go through your discussion, you want to make sure the others, so the government will involve these guidances as authority, and I'm telling you this part here to show you that that's what's going to happen if you move your habeas forward because they have the burden to show. And you just, that's where you state, but you had an obligation to find the truth, not what was a guidance. You had the obligation to find the fact of transmissibility, not 
listen to a suggestion, which, if it was an imposition, would actually violate the Constitution. The absence of the certifications at the state level, down to the local counties, is proof that they didn't have the test as well on the back side of that. In other words, any, any certification at this point would also be evidence of open fraud. And what's interesting is none of the none of them did that. If you listen to how they did it, they did it through meetings and, and uh, mealy mouthing through council people that didn't have a clue, but thought they were doing something maybe, and and just accepted that as an authority. But the authority for the purpose of the law was certification, certification then recording for public notice of the condition. And so, there. If, if, again, you got to get this in your mind about what you're after. Otherwise, it's uh, you're going to fall a lot short of moving uh, over. So we can't, there's no authority. They can retract all this stuff. People die over these uh, medical journals and this information. If they would have functioned properly from the local level, there would have been no interference with what a doctor was doing to treat the problem of the patient he privately saw before him or her. I uh, want to bring up now, relative to what Jock Rappaport in his uh, tweet says, uh, the bombshell after bombshell captured in her hidden vo footage evidence of murder, manslaughter, malfeasance, fraud, and I just say all of the above and more. Okay, Treason comes to mind here. This is a valuable, I guess, inside insider nurse Video investigator reporting, uh, pretty devastating. This video, and I don't have a, more to say. I'll just give you the link later. Perspectives on the on the pandemic is the title. You can go there. Hopefully not now in the next hour and a half. Uh, you you take the time it takes to listen to this. This is video. I don't think I've done more wows in a video than I, I ever have ever in any kind of looking at, at fantastic proofs, if you will. Given that this is not a setup again, I don't think it is at all. It's one thing to be able to put the dots together. It's one thing to be able to gather the information to know what she's saying is the truth before you see someone record the fact from inside. But once you see that how it gets worked out, that it is happening, these, these, the fraud, the ongoing fraud about this, how they set the system sets people up to die, how the system's rules are set up to kill you. You actually need it just to see how, how you're how, your ta how they take your trust and they turn it into a profit and ultimately your death. And the ironic thing about this, I got wow, wow, wow about this whole video up until the end. To me, it was like holy smoke when I find out who was the only one that survives this fraud, this medical malfeasance, this crime of the century. Remember, you got the crime of the century in the imposition of COVID-19, and then you have the people that are profiting from it in these in a no, a no less a state-operated hospital. Another conflict of interest here. Now, who is the one that survives? The drug addict who had taken so many drugs, his system didn't even notice that they were trying to kill him with all the paralytics and other things they do when they try to ventilate you. It wasn't tough enough for him. His body was used to it because he was a drug addict, what they were trying to do to kill him. Eventually, he pulls out his own ventilator tube, which ends it for the hospital. They intubate the tube, or they, you extubate it, and that ends it. If you don't then get thrown into another set of drugs to keep you down while you heal, so to speak. But the only one to survive this, you'll hear, which I just blows me away, was a drug addict. Because his tolerance was so high... They don't give people that much drugs at a time. And his body said, it wasn't enough. I've had it here. I've done. And he's the only one that lived. And he still believed that they saved his life. To show you how screwed up we are as a society in our perception. And how deep the programming actually is. We got, but anyway, this, you need to, I think you need to see this video perspectives on pandemic like i said i was one wow after the next and i'm looking at stuff i've told you all about i'm watching and hearing someone who is actually on the inside to prove and confirm it all and that was a big it's always a big deal to hear that other side it's always conjecture if you will 
it's kind of hearsay that we can put two and two together. In fact, when you do your court cases, you, if you do a complaint or even just a letter to an official, you can't even put your letter together. They won't even recognize it if you start talking in the in these, you believe you can put together stuff. You really need the more substantial proof. She offers it. She offers video. Granted, she offers audio that we don't see pictures, but I'm going to take it for what it is because when you look at the totality of what's going on, it really paints the picture of how we see outwardly, when we finally see outwardly, how it came to be what we saw, why the government officials could say what they were doing, how they were using those exploitations to justify their position when it was all just justifying crime. The, essentially, this is also a plunder on the Treasury. They were taking people who had Medicare as well for federal funding. I told you, this is, seems to me more like a money laundering condition that they've also exploited to provide funding for places because this nurse worked at a place, another hospital, that wasn't a government hospital, state-run hospital. And their processes, their procedures were completely different they never lost a patient, and they actually actually says they use hydro, uh, hydrochloroquine. I said that wrong, I think. Hydroxychloroquine. And so you see the dynamic in one woman not putting up with it, being the nurse that she should have been, the advocate she was trained to be and her spirit said to be. And you watch and you listen inside the system, the administration, how... It so-called justifies its condition. The doctors were the worst, actually. They just, they throw it out there. There's no testing that can be done. There's nothing to do. And they just sit there and don't, don't really engage it. And the problem with that dynamic, a nurse doesn't have any authority against a doctor. And so the system, as I've told you, the system is built to self-heal, self-protect, and to keep the eyeballs out of the, the problem. And it takes someone like myself over time now to be able to understand these types of mechanisms and to start looking for how, the evidence that they would be occurring given the dynamic that happens in the exploitation. I wouldn't do it in the medical field. That's not my focus. What I'm saying is you can take, I can just see what she's finding. You would take that the outcomes that you saw that stop making sense. I told you, whenever you see something that stop making sense, question, start going in there. You're going to find answers if you start to research that. But it's not the matter of just researching. It's a matter of taking that and going and doing something with it. And so I'll just get up. Just, I don't even know what more to say. You need to see this video. It's, uh, like I said, all I had to, all I could say was under my breath. Wow, wow, wow. And then to hear that the drug addict actually is the only one to survive the, the crimes. This is where we've gotten. And then I wondered whether or not the war on drugs was, was actually part of that, even though the counter-reaction is to make more addicts. But, but anyway, a corrupt, uh, corrupt World Health Organization does a 180, now says the asymptomatic spread of coronavirus is very rare. So there's been a, quite a few people now that see finally, they see the, the bounce back, the pendulum swing, how nothing is stable. Uh, nothing is, uh, they're just suggestions. These are not experts. They turned a, a, around just like the the Lancet did. The corrupt World Health, uh, again, opinionated the corrupt. Well, I have to agree with this. But anyway, the corrupt World Health Organization did a complete 180 on Monday. The who, not the rock group and not the owl, not a nice little creature in the forest, is uh, unless you're a mouse or a rat, right? At any rate, don't be one of those. The who, the who is now admitting that asymptomatic spread of the coronavirus is very rare. For months, the world was told to stay home, and if they dare go out in public, wear a mask and stay six feet away from each other. For months, the world was told that the coronavirus would kill millions of the U.S. alone because the virus would be difficult to contain due to asymptomatic transmission and infections. Now, I want to have you go back quickly. I talked about the Princess Cruz Petri dish. And this is all where I started to get the coding that they were talking about, which confirmed for me, just solidified the point about there is no test. Notwithstanding the lunacy, when we heard that asymptomatic, everybody, 80% of the people became asymptomatic. And why would that be? Well, they weren't telling you also, well, maybe if you were immune to it before, your body responds to it. Hey, you would, you would, say, you would uh, test positive in the antibodies because your body responds to it, but you wouldn't feel anything. 
But it wasn't like you were a carrier either, was it? But this is what they started to twist. They lost control. They needed to find the boogeyman everywhere. So you'd all agree with it. And so far you have because you're not fighting back and utilizing these things we now come out down the road to show, as you heard one court saying, we're going to have to wait and watch this and see how it rolls out. Well, here it's rolling out. And it's not rolling out in, in the government's favor at all. And this is why you keep focusing. So the, in a way that's irrelevant, the fact that they suggested wrongly, but they took the local authority took cognizance of it without doing the test, which there is none, is the dereliction of the local official because of this problem. They go with the political wind. This was not a medical decision. As I said, they didn't change. Listen, remember this. The WHO did not change its assessment relative to COVID-19, which was named different before. It just characterized it as a pandemic, whatever this was. They've never identified an infectious cause, and they can't. There is no test. Even SARS, reference to SARS, is itself only a symptom. SARS-CoV-2, all right, the second one they've told us they've identified, but there is no test. All right, so let's forget the last number. doesn't matter. Let's just look at SARS-CoV. They say COV means coronavirus. That's your definition of transmissible disease. SARS is the disease, like COVID. Coronavirus would be the infectious agent. They can't exist apart. But SARS is not more than a disease. It's like COVID. It doesn't cause anything. It looks like the what? The flu-like symptoms that you get when you get your body, your, your immune system kicked into gear, which would flip their antibody test into positive, wouldn't it? If they're accurate, and we find out half of those aren't. So this whole thing, I'm saying lots of words, but you'd peel this down into very simple little sentences about the, you anticipate the reliance upon these issues by the local official, but said the law required that you find the fact. And there is no test. And they knew that. So is it a coincidence that who is now admitting asymptomatic spread of the coronavirus is rare after left-wing riders took to the streets and burned the cities down? Well, now you're making the connection back to where, why, they, how they transitioned over uh, and gave it cover, and then they move away. But this has been predicted. I predicted all of this already oh, for years, not about just this. This is the other thing that's going on. They're also finding here there is no secondary transmission onward and it's rare and so this is the, the second wave they're admitting to you none of this was anything there's no reliance that could be taken and the local law would say should not have been taken with even the cdc's suggestion let alone some political organization under color of a medical benefits global now the ramifications of all this move on that they use this cover that they cannot show and have not certified to, which is your main focus. You don't get involved in how many people died or didn't die or the relative relationship between influenza and that you can transfer the numbers over to so-called COVID-19, which is just a disease, no causative agent. There is no test for the causative agent. In fact, influenza in general, there is no test. In fact, the vaccines, they have to guess that they're going to choose the correct one. Why? Because all these things mutate in such a way that vaccines may or may not be valid. So we have a bunch of disease without causes. The test they present to you doesn't test the cause. It tests you've been, your immune system kicked in for some reason, not even maybe viral. It could have been bacterial or some other invasion, insult. But but, there, but the governments are now, as we keep moving this thing through to show you, as predicted, they're going to they lock you down. As I told you, what they started in 9-11, they're going to continue worse. Now they weren't, you're not just an enemy combatant. You're a viral vector now, which is a public health issue. And no one is shutting that down. But here we are, Georgia health officials to collect blood samples from residents. This isn't even a new story. This one's been back. I finally I had to pull it up because I have another one. 
They're using it as we move through. The Georgia Department of Public Health announced it would visit some residences, some residences, Fulton County and DeKalb counties, and ask for blood samples. They will ask. We went through this before. I've talked about it. I'm bringing it up again because it's starting to become more prevalent again. They want their DNA sample collection as well, but that they are asking. When you understand what I'm saying and you have your your another a separate letter together to confront them, it would be the contact tracers as well. If those get if that gets any traction, you will be responding the way I'm telling you about how to respond to this, or you will be forced eventually over time or suffer consequences relative to the imposition that you have challenged correctly. The only way to challenge correctly, we got a decision now. How much deference they're going to give to the executive, the governors, is something I've been talking about, something I knew was there, something I knew the courts would give to them, and something you had to defeat. is now proven in a court case decision we just got here on Friday. Uh, but this one now moved back over to Georgia's doing it. Now Whitmer uh, signs roadside drug testing into law. Governor Gretchen Whitmer on Thursday signed a law, Senate Bill 718, which clarifies a statewide pilot program for roadside drug testing for drivers. Now, this is drugs. Okay, what they've been working with this one for a long time, they're, just, they're calling this a cleanup bill. For those of you that understand what I talked about at patent rights, then you're granted right of ingress and egress. As opposed and distinct from the commercial authority and right that the motor co- vehicle code is, as long as you continue without maybe either an injunction or a habeas relative to the mischaracterization of your particular use, and enjoin or is stopped somehow by remedy by habeas, your restraint of liberty to use the road as it was granted to you, as opposed to mischaracterized as a commercial endeavor that you're on the road that the Michigan State Police have a right to clean up <laughs> and check for, you will all be subject to this. And it, it, I told you before, it's not going to go well going ahead and trying to deal with it after the fact. And so just a word of warning, just, this is just notice, it's coming, it's starting to roll out more appropriately. And if they can get it for so-called drugs, they're going to get it for, for, the, for the viruses. It's just part of how this thing works. And a lot of it is based on the mischaracterization of the status that you're in the public. I don't mean in the government, I mean out in the common, if you will, areas. That they, you allow the government to mischaracterize you or your property your status relative to your property or your use. And that's how they do taxes on property. They mischaracterize it as an ad valorem commercial property with less than fee simple rights, and they tax you for that. That's like leases and rents and all that. So everyone says, oh, I'm, not, I'm, only, I'm, not, I'm only paying to rent my property because you're letting it be treated as a rental, if you will. And they, again, income, if you look at, I don't know if this is all in all states, a couple states I've read, income is the royalties from rents. So you're deemed to be getting rents from yourself in your own payment. You don't even understand how this thing is wired to eliminate it. And same thing here. So they treat your pro- physical property, your landed property, as commercial property that's less than fee simple. You, they treat your in, ingress and egress rights as a commercial use that is regulable, and you all stay crickets over it. And so what's coming down is these uh, drawing of the blood. The vampires are coming out. You're letting... The vampire in your private rights door when you don't address the mischaracterization in, in a proper way. You don't talk about your right to drive. Come on, let's, let's get to the, let's, let's grow up a bit. Let's move into, as I told you, the patent law, grant law, what you're allowed to do by grant. And I say allowed because right now that's your mentality. You think, you think an allowance instead of grant and the trespass. Once you, I get you folks to start thinking in the grant to you or your antecedent power before and the abuse of that, maybe we're going to get start moving some, some more. So here we go again. Now we've got surveillance coming down. Protests be damned. Tennessee to approve state police highway sur- surveillance power a program. State police, not peace, not peace officers, policing. That's in commerce regulation oversight. Remember, that's federal as well. It's in commerce, so it's actually a federal thing you're dealing with. But Tennessee's now going to go ahead. Protest be damned. That's a, that's an, uh, the author misunderstands, at least from my perspective and my study, misunderstands the condition. There would be no protest that you make against this. You would make, as someone who's subject, the 
administrative uh, con uh, comment add to it an excess or more importantly an infringement that costs you money in implementing that was not warranted that's how you have to respond to that but your status is one in commerce state police highway surveillance program this is in commerce this is something they can police regulate and keep track of and all y'all that complain about this it's rolling out but all y'all that complain about it have not stepped up not with your right to drive it's the fiduciary breach to the enabling act that said that this land was conveyed to the people not the government absolutely exclusively with apartment rights in this case and i'm talking particularly uh, to the so-called highway you're granted that highway what happened to that granted right is an infringement on that ingress and egress and if you use these words i'm saying instead of your right to travel or the state highway or whatever you start using the right instead as a pertinent to another right that was granted and an obligation for the government to keep, you're going to be sitting in a much different and, I have to say, better condition. Whether or not you totally see justice in there, that is partly because not enough of us are doing it, but I'm going to tell you I've run this thing couple just to let some of you know and not to go too deep. It wasn't a complete victory. Running an equity suit against a traffic stop shut the whole thing down and we never heard anything from the court they won't even entertain the equity suit which is a collateral attack just as i tell you the government cannot answer to that and they didn't what they did is they shut down every aspect of applying getting into the case anymore not a complete win i'm just saying when we do certain things in certain ways now it, it shut it makes it causes all different things to go on you actually see the corruption of the system, but on the other hand, there's not any more, as I can see, there's not any more infringement going on either. And so, not a complete answer, but it sits there as an example. There's better ways to approach this. Going and arguing in the system about a regulable highway with all the evidence against you is that you're a, a commerce entity and commerce agent. Yeah, you're going to get beat down by the regulator. You go out and you say, wait a minute, that was an encroachment, an infringement. You had the duty not to do and the obligation that wouldn't breach the obligations of the state to protect you. That's a whole different position. And I preserve, I tell you what, after looking at all this, in particular, looking through the mining law, which got me here, uh, I prefer that a a aspect of this much, much better. Now, move into how they're going to treat you. When we talked about this, I told you 9-11, remember, as we came into the first of the year, I said, hindsight 2020, this is the year they're going to remind you, and this is the opportunity you have when they bring us and they turn the E-Tives down a little tighter, maybe a lot tighter, they're going to bring in the worst of it, which was, I said, milit medical martial law, medical impositions, which was the public health authorities, because of where, what was happening since 2012, actually, and, and told to us. I said, this is all because of that. And we now see what's going to happen, and the referencing to 9-11 things is coming out. Uh, what was called a deeply disturbing New York Supreme Court judge rules protesters can be detained indefinitely. So all you protesters out there, listen up. And I'm not talking about the ones that think they're, they're occupying. Those are all, everyone's just a big trespasser. Everyone does it, everyone's doing what, they're, what the puppet masters are telling them. The ones that are down there, the ones that step back are actually the, the ones that are playing this. The people that are going to come down like the Chaz and we're going to clean up the streets and make them free to roam again. You're kind of forgetting the dynamic already. And then the rest of us watching in. We're all part of that, that uh, theater. That's a good word anymore. It will be coming to my mind. It's all theater. And we're all part of it. Now, I would like to think that I'm calling it out and doing what I can behind the scenes to not let things go where they are as best I can, not someone who's just a witness to it. But it's tr been truly my experience. Not many want to listen. They really don't. They'll, and then when I suggest after the fact how it was supposed to go and it didn't go well or didn't go the way they had planned, then they get mad at me. It's again, you know, destroy the messenger over, kill the messenger over the problem. Don't learn. And until I get to see that we're moving in what appears to me to be better ways to go, 
when everybody who gets a traffic ticket does an injunction utilizing their right, a granted right of ingress and egress and understands what I'm saying and promotes it, pre presents it that way as a collateral attack properly done, and there's a mass of us doing that, this stuff is going to continue. And so as long as we're not doing that, the deference of authority sits in the government itself because they're best positioned and you all are presumed to have put her there whether or not you voted whether or not you actually consent your lack of consent is in your response to the infringement that's really all you have anymore a New York State Supreme Court judge on Thursday rejected a petition seeking the immediate release of hundreds of protesters who had been held by the New York Police Department for more than 24 hours, ruling that extraordinary circumstances justify indefinite detention. Now, have you ever seen that anywhere written in the Constitution? If you say no, then you're not living in the place you thought there was a Constitution. There's a usurper right there. And he says, it's, it is a crisis within a crisis, wrote Justice James Burke in his ruling. All writs are denied. Burke's decision was met with alarm by New York lawmakers and activists who act immediately condemned the ruling as an unlawful suspension of the right of habeas corpus, which requires the government to justify detention of person before a court. Hundreds of New, York pro New Yorkers have been arrested in recent days during the mass protests over the May 25th killing of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police officers. Quote, the New York, the, 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 now this is a statement from Twitter, I suppose, by the by Marlon uh, Bodden, uh, Legal Aid Society. The New York, uh, New York, uh, the NYPD has no excuses with its 38,000 police officers and the best technology in the world with all the money they are, are given. They have no excuse not to process them in timely manner. That is a stakeholder, a stockholder, a stakeholder. Uh, statement of using a stocking horse. That does, is not responsive to the condition. It's irrelevant what the government asset, what government puts there uh, to stop this. What you're looking at is a judge who just suspended the writ of habeas corpus because there's a crisis within a crisis. I'd have felt better if he said this is an insurrection. But he didn't even try to go there. A crisis within a crisis. What have I said? You better kill these so-called domino crises down. You better kill them, otherwise they're going to be built up against you. What crisis is he talking about? He's talking, and I told you they're connecting these up. The the domino of COVID, and I say this is a domino for you. You just got to knock it down. Now, um, together with the domino of the protests. And as I've explained to you and can show, I think very clearly, given there is no test, and there has been no certification, in the government itself, They're, the first crisis he assumes doesn't even exist. He has, and this is going to be a theme as well, there's no evidence in existence for these assumptions that are essentially stated as hearsay, I'll say. Hearsay. No evidence in, in, a, in, a, in a, the record as to crisis upon crisis. As I told you, they would be uh, adding together manifolding up together uh, against you. And now we hear uh, for a, an interpretation of indefinite detention. Now, the other problem with this, they did file for a writ, and I've got, this is where I get to the, some of the examples for you. They did file for a writ, it was denied, but it was in the context of a criminal case. And so there's going to be a cloud in that. There's not going to be a clarity whether or not he suspended it in preference to he should have actually denied them because he had a criminal process that they, the government, wasn't going to have to show. Because the petitions didn't make the case for release would have been an actually better answer, which tells me they're not too smart either. But at any rate, I'm just trying to show you what you're looking for. That they are now broaching the idea that if they can compile crisis after crisis upon you, that's sufficient to indefinitely detain you. Which they actually didn't need when you looked at the PATRIOT Act. You're all presumed to be enemy combatants waiting for your first misdemeanor, is all that really required. Anyway, okay, so we have it now. 
we're now looking at the crisis upon crisis creating the apparent right of indefinite detention within the process of a criminal proceeding. Now, it won't, if this judge made misstatements as to his authority and they challenge that, that's what the appellate court's going to go out on. They'll, well, he meant this and he meant that. He'll be able to respond too. He'll be able to respond into that to clarify that after the fact. And so this is a weak way to go at it. And it's not that the way, not an example of the habeas I'm saying you file. Certainly this was a bulk habeas as well. And based on a bulk complaint, it didn't rise to the occasion to invoke the release. And that would have to then turn on whether or not the judge, and giving him any kind of insight, whether or not the complaints were sufficient on their face. And he could he could probably go out with that. But you see now, if you didn't think that the habeas is, an, is a remedy, you now see that it is. You also see he had to make a decision on it, whether or not we agree or not. He says all writs are denied. The writ is the thing he would sign, not the complaint for the writ. And I want you to start paying attention to these things. For those of you that never heard this before, you're lost. But for those of you who did a little bit of reading, you're seeing some of how the re reading relates to the forms and what the process will be. Manhattan judge denies legal aid request for, to free hundreds of George Floyd protests held more than 24 hours. Another story, again, I just pulled this stuff up for the notice to you on how this thing starts to work. They said they were detained illegally. That's what you would phrase in a longer frame, which I think I like to use better, is the unwarranted or unlawful restraint of your liberty. And in this case, it's a liberty because it's a civil distinction in the right. It's literally inside the liberty part. And this is where you could get to privileges and immunities, but I'm not going to go that far because that's a very convoluted source of law to respond to. Simply put, a blanket habeas in this case didn't, do anything but get the blanket boot. But they exist, I guess, is the other thing. So be careful on not rewriting them. Be careful on trying to get involved with a mass of people. I've told you, do not go into the streets. You turn your attention on those that are allowing what you see going on in the streets. And you do that, each one of you. It's the only thing I can just tell you. We're given evidence and example as we came right into this. I told you Virginia. I'm just still continuing believing. I just can't find an answer around it. Virginia was the notice of how we were supposed to move through. And we kind of failed that part. But that doesn't mean the example wasn't there to follow. And then we got into medical. And that moves it to you, each one of you. The medical vector of a virus that they can't... Uh, they can't, the asymptomatic retraction now that they can't prove is now on each one of you. They went from broad to narrow. You have to now move to your remedies. And so we see the remedy of habeas is working. It's there. It didn't work in this case. I'll have an example also, though, in, your, in the links of the same law group did get some uh, people out released through a habeas to show you that they do work. For those of you that don't think they work, they're there. Whether or not they become a political tool, I don't know. One of, my, one of my experiences in habeas was when you write them, they boot your friend out. I did it on behalf of my friend, like the law said. I told you that, that story, the help I got from a, a real lawyer who saw what I was trying to do and realized my error. It really wasn't an error of, of content. It was an error of organization relative to the statute. Where I say follow the black and white in the order that it says to do things. And all I did was flip everything back in the order, followed by the black and white statute that told me how to do it. And my friend was kicked out of court after I filed that petition. Or excuse me, kicked out of jail. Why? Because when the, you're not restrained of your liberty, the writ of the petition goes what they call moot. M-O-O-T, not mute. M-U-T-E, moot. It falls ineffectual, falls silent uh, as to what the court could do. And so they booted my friend out. And so the petition didn't get heard, but it had the force and effect of what it was supposed to do. Uh, stop the unwarranted restraint, in which we proved it was an unwarranted restraint. Or at least to the one the sheriff didn't want to have to answer to. And so these things are there. 
And uh, there's a, you have to understand them a bit. You have, do have to do a bit of study. And, and there, we're seeing today what I've been telling you. If you want to get removed from your, your binding, if you will, your prison, here they are coming in the news about how this works. We're seeing a failure. We're seeing what I told you about the domino effect being built up against you. And all you got to do is kick down the first one. And that shows that the judge is probably wrong. But nobody's going to do that, because, in my mind, because the attorneys are coming forward with all the things they're trying to do to protect you all. They're not protecting you in the proper way. They're protecting you in ways that brings up this this condition that brings the government more into power. So this um, so if you go to the link I gave you, they have a law uh, the writ the but they call the lawsuit. The link actually goes to the writ. Now for those of you doing the writ of habeas corpus and you want a form. This is not the form. This is the outline. You would have to fill your information. But I think it's this first Manhattan link that gets you to the writ. The writ is the one the judge would sign. So it's it's kind of filled out in blank. It's filled out with the command to bring uh, to the entity under the jurisdiction of the proper judge having jurisdiction over the entity to bring the body to court for the interrogation, the obligation of the holder to prove that they have the right. So the first link I give you is to the, um, their link there is actually to the writ, not their complaint. I found from this website, these legal aid people, another case, just so I went back and through their news and found another promotion they were doing about how they did get some people out. If you go to, I give you another link, it's a different case. It's where they did really get some people released and And, I, okay, I have, uh, sorry, I have a couple links. Uh, I just realized. That link takes you to their complaint. It's like 48-something pages. You don't want, you don't necessarily want to go 48 pages. You want to do yours as succinct and short and sufficient and complete as possible. Not that it can go, can't go longer or shorter. I'm just saying be careful not to take these models that you have to do this uh, the way it was done for that other subject matter. But you have a form of what a complaint for a writ for the judge to sign is. And these are the component parts in a habeas proceeding. You do your complaint, and you include what they call the writ of habeas corpus. So I also have the link of the writ from the lawsuit, and then on their web page, Legal Aid Society, I have their their list to where they had another lawsuit, and they give you the petition itself. So for those of you writing a petition and you want to see what they look like, it's just a, the petition just a complaint with all your facts that you've laid, all the findings you've had of how it's incorrect and wrong, whatever words you, unlawful, whatever the things you came up with to show that they didn't derelict, uh, to show the petition has with it attached another form you make up called a writ. In between these links, I can't, I can't remember how I did it, you have the example of the petition and and the writ that gets submitted when you do your filing, or a friend of yours that states that he's doing it on your behalf, and you want to find the provision in the code that says it can be done on your behalf. I've read that, and I think it was the Texas the Texas information I read a few a few broadcasts ago. Uh, so here we have that the writ works; it's not abandoned, but that. They, they're temporarily, I think, building crisis upon crisis in order for uh, for the suspension to maybe occur. I don't know that that was actually suspension. It could be characterized as one as a. But I. But when you don't, when all the writs are denied, and they didn't say a reason, as I suggested he he could have, then it's suspicious whether or not he actually had authority or her or whoever the judge would be in this case. These are one of the things you now have to anticipate in this new lockdown world. And so if you go in as a group, then you're seeing that the likelihood of you being treated together is now proven in, in, the, in the notice to the news. So, uh, okay, so the, there's those of you that are in the habeas and want to see, I don't really like going to the forums, but you see what, what one law group, how they r arrange their complaint, they attach the writ, I have example for a different case shows you what the writ looks like. In that case, it's only two pages. It's just uh, and essentially, I think all the codes explain to you. You can copy and paste the things that are included. So this is not even that hard to to put together. 
Again, the hardest thing you have to do is understand what the codes say relative to your cause and how you succinctly state the how the restraint is unwarranted and keeps you from a liberty or any number of liberties that are being you're being restrained of. Okay, so now you're relying on a, an attorney here who did it wrong. In one regard, he did it right. They did it wrong. The condition changed in the same town. And you see that the, the, the fluid dynamics of this, as I keep telling you, you have to have an evolutionary engagement. You have to understand that you may be up against this. Myself, if I was somebody in the different, I mean, if I wasn't part of the group and all writs are denied, I would probably have to file a remedy on that. And here's the problem. They start jamming all this stuff together. You get confused. It's it's another thing that, as you see in that uh, pandemic video, they those that didn't test, they treated as if they would put them in wards that would be sick. Then you would get sick, and then they would put you in a ventilator, and you then would die, unless you happen to be lucky enough to be a drug addict, and and your body was too tolerant of all the drugs that they could. They felt they felt that they were hurting you with. You actually could handle the rest. It's kind of the same thing here. They treat you in a way that's not that you're not actually susceptible to. That becomes another violation. And so, again, you just have to understand what you're up against. But here we have the what I've been telling you. This remedy of habeas corpus is in the news. You see one side it gets agreed to, the other another case it doesn't. So there it is. It's working. And now I'm saying that uh, I'm not saying at all. The law says, and the courts have said, you have to go in there and do your remedy for you. Injunction's not working, and I explained why that is, in particular coming from the state, and the ability of a governor of a state to utilize the master, the master's authority in the federal government to deny to the, to the victim of the state slave. You're not even a state slave, folks. The governors are. Have you got that? going to the federal master in order to tell you you don't have a right on an injunction. Also notice that not many people are stepping up in the first right. These are organizations. You have to take cognizance of all this as you're moving your ideas through and how you think you're going to address this. Uh, now we move, keep moving on here. Protesters across the United States attacked by cars driven into crowds and men with guns. Here's the starting up of the Boogaloo movement that we talked about before. I said Boogaloo bug uh, Bugaboo is a old old broadcast is back back in the beginning of the year they're starting to put some pressure the so-called um, civil civil war type idea that, that like having a gun is a problem people running into crowds they're bringing up uh, sec, statuses of people that they put names on which puts a big wet blanket on everything that's going on again evidence that maybe you shouldn't be out in the public right now if you wanted to uh, to protect your rights. Going in big mass groups is probably not what's going to happen. Acting as the lone gunman out in the streets is likely not something. And you're being vilified already before you got there, uh, even if you're justified. See, I don't know if some of these people are getting attacked by the mob and they come out of their cars protecting themselves, a, a mass mob. This brings up the use of force justification. You better know that anymore. You better understand in your the state that you're doing this, you better understand the use of force uh, doctrine, if you will, the the standard, so that you have a word in your mouth when you're attacked, legitimately attacked, and need to defend yourself. And I'm not sure. I'm going to say this in general. Please don't. Better go look careful. But they keep bringing up the idea that if you show a gun, it's brandishing. I'm. I think my memory is clear enough that we had a sheriff come in to explain to us after we had a minor going to jail because he remained silent on his defense about about his use of a gun against someone that attacked him. We found out after the fact of the fact of that you have to testify in your own behalf, otherwise it goes against you. You have to defend yourself in the use of the arm. Uh, in this case. Uh, the miner took the arm off of someone who dra grabbed his shotgun, and that wasn't even good enough. The miner spent 7 to 12 years in jail, and we found out after the fact there's this use of force, and you have to be able to articulate your reasonable use of the force that you used. It has nothing to do with having a gun 
and someone else not having a gun or anything. You have to understand that it could be you against a gang, someone that was more capable, an older, an older elder or, or against a younger has the capacity, but you have to know what that is. And so if you're going to be put, you're being put in to defend yourself now, you can find yourself into a protest area, legitimately have to pr protect yourself, you're going to be put into this vilification. Now, to answer about this, you're going to have to understand the use of force and why you came out with your gun. Now, if you're a nut, you're not listening to me anyway, but you're not listening to me. So, you're going to do this anyway. They're building up the case against every one of you, so-called law-abiding, those of you that are good people, and you have to respond. They're building the case against you before you got there. You're going to have to know more. And if it, what I understand is brandishing, like they'd be blamed when you show the gun, and you listen very carefully, Make sure, if I understand this, and double check where you're at, that they're recognizing this. To pull the gun out in defense, definitely do not point it at anybody. In fact, point it on the gr to the ground, pull it out, and pull it down, and do your reasonable defense. It is not brandishing. Now, I want you to all double check that with the state where you live. But moving into a defensive mode that doesn't threaten anybody, I don't think it's considered brandishing anywhere that you're going to need to know about this stuff in case, because these things are fomented, you happen yourself into a condition. Could actually happen in your front yard or whatever. So, this is what they're putting on. You You people are going to have to know what, your, what, the, um, what the standard is for your performance. But now they're talking and promoting the Boogaloo movement. They're talking about well, Boogaloo Boys, B-O-I-S, they're now, and they're talking about this stuff is happening in all areas. They're now fomenting the idea that if you have a gun in a car and you kind of run into some problems, it's as if they want to predict, predict that you're not going to have this ability to protect yourself. And you do if you have a better word in your mouth. And I'm not going to be here to tell you because it changes from state to state what the standard is. And you will definitely have to defend yourself. There's nobody that can actually say that. In fact, at the time, you want to make sure that you be very tight-lipped because anything you say will be used against you. They will want to crucify you. In other words, evidence that a, a, an invader, a trespasser onto a miner's claim, grabbing the shotgun and pulling on it, which actually pulled the trigger on the guy's hat on his hand, was not enough to protect the miner in protecting himself. So, Consider how that uh, how it's stacked against you, and maybe how far this thing's gone off of what you expected in a so-called, you know, Second Amendment right. There's a whole lot more that goes with all this. Uh, but uh, okay, so they're they're fomenting this this dynamic of being attacked and uh, against certain types of supremacists and all these other things that they bring up, all these names to pigeonhole you. They're in the they when they do that, they bring into question your ability to defend yourself. I'm suggesting to you what that does is it requires you to know the narrow path of your defenses. You can't be ignorant anymore. They're really pressing this. And we see now that one of the other stories, Pentagon war games include scenario for military response to domestic Gen Z rebellion. All right? So they're bringing all these little sub-factions of society together. The military is already doing, has already done war games on this, and it's coming out. Well, I've been telling you, be very careful of how you progress through this uh, this interesting time. Uh, in the face of protests composed largely of young people, the presence of Americans' military on the streets of major cities has been a controversial development. Only controversial, folks, but there it is. Controversial development. But this isn't the first time that Gen Z, those born after 1996, has popped up on the ra Pentagon's radar. Documents obtained by the Intercept via the Freedom of Information Act reveal the Pentagon war game called the 2018 Joint Land, Air, and Sea Strategy Special Program, or GLASS, offered a scenario in which the members of Generation Z, driven by malaise and discontent, launch a Z, launch a Z bellion in America in the mid-2020s. I'll stop there. If you don't think that they also have war games played out for the Gangs coming together to go over and kick Chaz out and any other thing while they sit back and watch. And oh, don't forget that the metropolitan plan they have for entire cities 
If you don't think that's already been sitting out there, and that uh, when I tell you to be very careful on what you think you know, and I find out three percenters and oath keepers and and all these guys who want to claim that they're doing their 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 oath and all that to protect the United States and understand none of them I've met have known and understand any of that. These are the main, mainly the guys that get mad at me when I explain it to them, and they end up seeing it. It's all written down, it seems, that if we just settle down and look at it, we'd be able to see a better way. But everybody wants to seem to be macho. And I don't quite get that in particular when you're not really the biggest and baddest, ultimately. But here they are. I talked to Generation Z a while back. Here it is. They have a, designs on you. They expect you to go out there. In fact, I was interested. It was weeks ago. Happened to go through a social feed. I can't remember where it was. Somebody actually made the comment, which I now believe, I knew after I saw it, I believed it was a fomenter stating, this is our time. We've trained for this. Trained. Okay, trained. We've trained for this. This is for us to do, inciting a violent response. Like they were capable. And so this is sitting there being ready to be executed. They're now coming out to us. I've been telling you they're going to try again. The Civil War will be fabricated as well. Although the Mike Biker gang's going to Chaz is kind of maybe making that a little quicker. And why are they doing that? But I get the principle. But that's not how that really, really works. In fact, it makes you a target, and I don't care. I mean, most people that hear that, oh, I'm a biker, I don't care. I'm not talking about that target. I'm talking about the society you live in. You, you think you're going down to be, you're a free country? You, you're a deluded uh, set of people. You, you live in an open-air prison. What the heck do you think you're, what do you think you're doing? You're in a war against, you are the, Medi the Pentagon's actually making war games against you inside the gates. Where do you think you live, folks? Anyway, so Generation Z, Please tune in behind the woodshed, get you enough knowledge to get you behind the woodshed and bring those officials that are taking your republic down, that protected you up until now, to task. Now, moving on, how oh, it's not going to be going to the government to do so. You have to do this. And then the numbers that you have. See, I mean, I, I feel if you got a bunch of gangs of and truckers and stuff going over to Chaz, and you set that up right, that would be another Virginia. But I don't think you're that forward-thinking enough to set it up right. Prove it. What was that little picture, that meme, sitting on a chair at, in a, with a sign on the front of my desk with a coffee cup? Change my mind. I wish you'd all would change my mind, but you haven't, and you can't. Well, I sound arrogant now, don't I? That's my experience. You can't. Change my mind. But we're going to see more of the, di the dynamic here as we move in and through. Uh, there was that court case I talked to you about moving over into this COVID. So they've taken that and moved this into the so-called civil war, these, these faction-breaking, divide-and-conquer moves that you feed, feed right in, just like little puppets. Like this, this little puppeteers running your bikes down the road and the truckers and all the, all the vets that are involved thinking you're standing up for the republic, not realizing, you know, you go after the people over there in the CHAZ, you forgot who set that up for them. You never stopped them. You haven't stopped them for the 30 years they've been acting as a cancer to steal your republic. Where do you think you live? If you're that blind, who do you think you are to make a decision? I guess I should remind you here, you're behind the woodshed. Oregon Supreme Court upholds governor's stay-at-home order. It was a case I told you it was a Baker County... I've uh, got some dynamic working. We can't. We don't have any actual tangible connection to any of the verbiage in the case. I told you they would do that. They hadn't argued the correct thing. Uh, that when the Baker County judge said, "Yeah, we're going to stop the governor's um, order, stay-at-home order," the state immediately did a mandamus. Didn't appeal. They did a mandamus. I identified for you that was a collateral attack. Like I say, your injunctions would be, or your mandamus, or your habeas, or collateral attacks. Writs in law, if you will, that are actually equity. But the Oregon Supreme Court upholds that governor's stay-at-home order, denounce what the judge said in a particular way that the governor in Oregon had the right and has the right to continue whatever plan they want 
to keep people underneath the reopening condition that the judge of the this circuit court extended beyond his authority to have that say. What I want to do right now, for those of you that are really wanting to understand more and pay attention, that I'm going to go to the decision, and I'm just going to read a couple passages to start this off to show you how you can just, just look at the passage and look at the court essentially being accomplice to the crime. And, be, and by the same method I've told you, has to be argued and put in the record before they decide to avoid such an outcome that is consistent with the problem at, our ha at hand and how I could predict this was going to go and they were going to figure out a way to allow the governor to have the deference authority to literally cause the harm their own constitution says should be prohibited. And it's very interesting how they, I guess, interesting, to me, it's an ongoing crime, how this went on. Let me start to read, go through a few pages here. Per curum, pe pere peremptory writ of mandamus to issue immediately in terms consistent with this opinion. So here's your writ of mandamus. It orders, it's a superior court ordering an inferior court or other entity subject uh, to do a thing or, or forbear it from doing a thing. Right, so this is a writ. It's in your laws. It's in your code. If you just go read, it says how you do these. You could, where there's a, a violation, you can actually have a court come in and order an official to stop or to continue but do better. There's actually quite a bit of, I think, four or five really clean things that you can have done if you just understood your remedies instead of complaining about it and just keep complaining. Uh, this case comes to you, and I want to go to do a quick analysis quickly as I go through. I want to show you. What I've suggested to you based on what they have said here and then what I've suggested to you that needed to be put in to avoid them to be able to assume, not even presume, but assume and impose, invoke an authority within the legislative, the executive branch that doesn't exist. This decision says this case comes to this court during a pandemic. Let me read a couple sentences, and I'm going to have to go back and chew this down a bit. Now, this case comes to this court during a pandemic. Now, your mind should be thinking about qualifying these words. This is supposed to be coming from a court of law looking at facts in the world relevant to their jurisdiction. And to my knowledge, no evidence was actually placed in the record whatsoever. And so proceeding on that observation, and by their decision here, we can destroy. Uh, we'll, we'll read a little bit here, and then I'll go back to it. This case comes to this court during a pandemic. Remember, this is a fact-in-law statement. During a pandemic. As we all know. Let me repeat that. And this was an in-bank, complete, every justice involved in the court to make this decision. Now, we talk, we'll define we here, but let's just say... This is talking in the general population. As we all know, a novel coronavirus was first detected in late 2019. And it has spread rapidly across the globe, killing hundreds of thousands of people. Even more people have fallen ill, and healthcare systems in cities around the world have been overwhelmed, including in the United States. As the virus has spread, government leaders have taken actions to protect people in their jurisdictions from illness and death. They have done so in the constantly changing circumstances, and they have responded to new information about the virus and its effects as it has become available. In this state, as in others, the governor has issued an issued executive orders to respond to the threat posed by the virus and the illness it causes, COVID-19. Because the virus spreads through the close personal contact and through the air, some of the orders have restricted the size of gatherings and required that the people maintain the specific distance between themselves and others. Relatedly, other orders have closed schools and businesses. The restrictions have had substantial consequences for individuals and entire economies. 
It is unknown how long those consequences will last, just as it is unknown how long it will be before there is a cure or vaccine for COVID-19. I'll end in the first paragraph. Where do I begin? I think this was written by some environmental terrorist out of a Lewis and Clark Law School. And I can imagine the glee on their face to write the, write the last part of that. It is unknown how long it will be before there is a cure or vaccine for COVID-19. Okay, that point aside, COVID-19 is what? Folks, pay attention to how this works. The fraud in your face is supposed to be a law decision. COVID-19 is what? We all should be saying in chorus, folks. The chorus, the choir should be singing. COVID-19 is what? You should be asking, well, what part of that, of what are you asking me? Because there's two, actually two parts to that answer. It's a disease by name. It's also a set of symptoms constituting the disease. Can there be a vaccine made against symptoms which this is flu-like symptoms? Can there actually be a vaccine? Is there a cure for flu-like symptoms? And that's a trick question as I think about it quick. There's a cure for flu-like symptoms. It's called death. Because a naturally functioning body will have flu-like symptoms every time its immune system is invoked. COVID-19 is a, is a set of symptoms. There is no way to have a vaccine for a set of symptoms. You, then we get to the point where they say that COVID-19, the ostensible cause, is a coronavirus, which you see does not name there, and that's the common cold, which is known not to be novel and can't be novel, and it's ubiquitous. Having very similar, though not the same, symptoms of influenza, the common cold is a lesser form of what? immune system response. Is there a vaccine available for common cold? We should be saying no, but this court believes that there is. And this gets us to our first problem. They were, they're assuming what they were told by the party who made the mandamus petition, which I said needed to be challenged up front. Did they have the right? They go through in this court case and they talk about in fact, the dissent talks about, we could have got to this answer instead of 42 pages. I could have done it a lot less. The, the circuit court judge simply did was it, uh, deciding in excess of his authority, and here's how. And that would have been it. He also admits in the dissent, which wasn't a dissent, it was a concurrence, but not by the way the court came to the same answer. He agreed that he saw irreparable harm. The thing that's mentioned ab above here, dealing with the economies. If you go read Article 10A in the Oregon Constitution, it says the emergencies, these emergencies, the disasters, are supposed to stop affecting the economies. I read all of that already behind Woodshed. So let's go back to the top. This case comes to this court during a pandemic. Folks, did you say not really? Did you answer what I've been telling you that you can see the who actually said? Not the who but the guy, the front man to the brokers of Pharma Harma. You see what he actually said. Did your mind say, no, it was characterized as pandemic, and the, the WHO made no change in their assessment. The court in law did not even recognize that judicially noticed fact when they made that first sentence statement, setting up that there could be a pandemic that they could recognize within their jurisdiction before they set it up to show what is required under state law to be evident before they got to the pandemic. They lead their error right in the first sentence. As we all know, a novel coronavirus was first detected in late 2019. Is that true? We all know that? Guy behind the woodshed doesn't know that, folks guy behind the woodshed said it wouldn't be the case early on. So we can't include this guy. Maybe not you either. 
And I don't mean just all oh, your disgruntlement and, dis and your complaint. I mean looking at the facts of the, the how this thing is set up and being able to articulate succinctly how it was a, a fraud. We all know is the first thing you have to attack in anything you bring in a habeas. And you're going to do that not by saying you don't know. You're going to do it by showing there was no certification that you could know. The certification required by the rules that you will talk to and footnote even. But this is the direction the government, the state, the state courts are doing that you have to defeat in your complaint against this thing. A novel coronavirus was first detected in late 2019. Was it actually? This may be, for those of you writing the habeas, you may have to add a little bit more than my mind was saying when I first was telling you about this. You may have to show and make the clean statement relative to no novel coronavirus was actually ever identified. It was only presumed. And it was presumed in acceptance by hearsay from China. May have to be a line added to this to attack that very statement so the government courts can't come out and say, we all know this, because they don't. And until you pull that evidence in in an affidavit, which your, your verified affidavit, your petition of habeas is, you make it an affidavit. That's how you make that. You may have to actually have another module attachment that is your affidavit saying it's the truth, but I like to make them together. But getting back to this, if you don't come out and show one line that says explains this, remember, it was only a presumptively a coronavirus that they deemed to be novel. You have to make that factual statement. If you don't, they'll go out on this right here. We all know it's novel. In fact, it's not. What's the punchline? There is no test, and there hasn't been. How do you know it's novel if there's no test for the virus, let alone its novelty? Am I speaking too fast for some of you folks? I mean, really? Is this so hard to put together? I'm not even out of the first second. I'm not even out of the second sentence, and it's just the things you have to speak to to destroy is given to us in the first couple pages of this uh, discussion if anybody would just load it down and start understanding it. They are taking assumptions, not even presumptions, and just throwing them in as law. Why? Because nobody came in to challenge any bit of it. They're conforming their decision to what I've told you you have to respond to before we get to this point. So the second part of this clause, and it has spread rapidly across the globe, killing hundreds of thousands of people, is not supported by the evidence where, what? They didn't really, but by hearsay, think, presume, without proof, that there was a coronavirus at all involved. Just moving on, even more people have fallen ill. Well, I'm going to stop. Why? We, you can say that if we all know a novel coronavirus did this, but there's no facts and evidence to support that. And that's what your complaint will say. How do you get to that? By saying they never did the assessment to certify the fact. And they couldn't. The absence of which is the fact there was no infectious agent. The suggestions by the CDC were, could not refute that fact, nor could the test, which is not a viral test. It's an antibody test. And you explained that little part. But moving on here. Well, there's so much I could explain in reading this, it's, but it's too much. Um, if I can't get you all just to start reading the black and white and putting together for yourself your protection to get out of your prison and the prison of your society is being put into, I don't even know why the little minutia details that are so important to see on how these people are talking and what they're really talking to and what the words mean, it's really, really irrelevant. I get pretty frustrated and I start thinking about that. But moving on, here's the killer thing. We all know the novel virus was detected. And then he moves on and says... As the virus has spread, comma, well, if you allow that we all know the novel coronavirus is, is, has been detected because you didn't prove it was only presumpted and never able to be checked for, then we get to go on and just agree together in this lawful decision there's a virus. Had you challenged its existence, they couldn't say as the virus spread. 
because that burden would have been put on the state immediately to prove the test they used in order to identify one. This governor would have had to do something that there's no scientist and no medical professional and no clinician has ever done in the history of the world. Come up with a test for the cause, the infectious agent for the symptoms. As the virus spread, if you don't challenge that there's no virus that they can test to spread, they get to say this, and we get to run down the primrose path to Hades. And they can hand the authority to the governor because there's a virus. Why is that important? Because in that state, and, I've, and you're finding out in your states that you're studying, even if they don't need the disease, the name, they have to have an infectious agent. It doesn't need to be viral. It could be bacterial. It could be other another environmental insult. So once they get you to buy in, it was a novel coronavirus because nobody challenged that there couldn't be, and that's not been certified to by the law. Then they get to go on with their myth and their fairy tale and their horror story. As the virus spread, the government leaders have taken actions to protect people in their jurisdictions and from illness and, health and death. To protect people. There's the state in the jurisdiction. Now you know it's limited to jurisdictions. Why I keep talking about the distinction between the suggestions of CDC and the pandemic of the international not imposing upon the obligation of duties within the jurisdictions, down to your counties. Everything I've told you is right here in the first few pages. And I, I didn't even read all of it. I did not read everything here. I just admit that to you in case you think I read through a lot of this stuff. I'm looking at whether or not what I'm telling you is valid and will take these things out immediately. Once I have, I don't really care the rest. There's probably more to defeat if I read more. The dissent was even says that there's irreparable harm. It makes the same assumptions, not even presumptions. There was no due process about that. Your first challenge of the fraud will be that due process. Until you bring it, that will be water under the bridge for the authority to keep you in your prison, your house, your FEMA camp. So they've given the governor the right right there by saying people are being protected. That's the public good from illness and death. Well, you can get lost on the illness and death, and we could get into all the statistics that are all been screwed up, but that's not the point. If we don't have a virus, and, you ha and you've challenged that, and they can't produce the fact of a giant vi virus because there is no test, you don't have to care about what the illnesses and deaths are attributed to. You could then, then point out that these records have been, by the CDC, said to be invalid because they're not, cor they're not correct. Proving again your, the establishment that you said that there was actually no infectious agent produced by the record in the law, the certifications required to show that was the what I will call the demonstrable exigence, the one thing, not the exigency, maybe any. Now I can see this is taking a little bit longer to describe than I was thinking, as it usually does, so much to say, so much to do, of all the tabs I usually pull up. But at any rate, I'm going to continue in this, a little bit of a detail here. I want to show you again, if you understood what I'm talking about in the past, they are evading all those points here in the opening pages, setting up the, the structure of how they were going to move, because no one properly challenged, as I've been telling you. My discussion today is the expression of how you go to a challenge that so that they can't do this. They may have another rat hole to climb out of. They're not going to have this one where we just assume a novel virus without you challenge, where they just assume it was around and spreading. In fact, they never certified to the infectious agent, the thing that makes the communicability the thing that empowers the epidemic. You take out the first domino so that they can't trigger this dominoes on you to their authority, which they give deference. Why? Because the governor is just protecting you all. Now they give them another license. They have done so this way constantly because of constantly changing circumstances, and they have responded to new information about the virus as its effects as it has become available. I've told you to address that coming out the gate, 
It's not constantly changing from the point they failed to make the certification. And until they made the certification, nothing's constantly changing. That's a fairy tale. Why? Because you haven't identified and certified to an infectious agent, the virus causing these dynamics, which excuses the governor for whatever she's or he's doing. If you don't understand, those two paragraphs or two sentences are the license extended because of a fairy tale, which has no fact and evidence to support it. And partly you would actually answer in response to that. If they ever came back, the state came back with trying to overcome its burden and said, well, it's just this and this. You say, there's no fact and evidence. It's not the only answer you'd come. You'd be looking for that. I would anticipate them to come up with a no answer. And if the, but the assertion. And there's no strike that uh, there's no there's no um, there's no evidence in, in record for the assertion. And the evidence would have been, Your Honor, if you go this way, discussion, make up discussion here. That you're standing there in the habeas. The, the evidence would have been the certification in the record. Now, to apply it to one state that I've seen some records to, and that would have been, and then you'd state your four points of the recordation, the, the assessment, the certification, the transmission, uh, through the, and you'd name the statute, and to the Secretary of State and the recording, you would name that. There's none of that was complied with. First of all, it wasn't done, so there's nothing to rely on a virus. Secondly, it proves there was no virus, otherwise there would have had to have been one there. You got them on both sides. So there's two sentences of license to the governor to be to abuse you, all done without evidence and without the actual without the actual answer. The people that answered to this mandamus did not point this stuff out, as I knew, as I said that's how it's going to fail. In this state, I was talking Oregon, as in others, the governors have issued executive orders to respond to the threat posed by the virus and the and the illness it causes. COVID-19. So this court actually defines, com, com, confines its discussion to the definition of communicable disease. You have to have an infectious agent, the virus in this case, and the illness. And they name it COVID-19. They tell you it's not the virus right there. So how can COVID-19 have a vaccine at the end sentence of that paragraph? But they do define in this law that they are assuming there is a communicable disease by naming in the first paragraph we have an infectious agent that we have a named label for. In that state, that's required underneath the definition of communicable disease. I've explained all this before. They are building their case in this, in this matter based on mere assumptions without evidence, but they're conforming to the requirements to make it look plausible this decision is actually valid. And I'll tell you what, it's valid. It's going to be valid because everyone's going to believe it. Only you, my dear listeners, those that will step up, that properly address these things, are going to be able to ferret this one out. As I've been explaining in long-term words here, how that gets done, I'm using the, I hope you've already heard, I'm only halfway back down through the paragraph. I'm hoping that you're hearing that the, I hope you see a decimation of their, of the premise that they've come from. All based in your thoughts that they have an authority that what they say is right. In fact, you're looking and witnessing how the courts, in this case, this is a really seriously corrupt court system, how these courts do legalisms right in front of your face that are not actually law, that look proper. And they're actually, these are, well, I would call them treason. These are aiding and abetting treason. But they look proper, and it's all because of how the case uh, what's, should I say not presented correctly? And I'll tell you, folks, despite our best efforts to get someone in that case to do it better, and they won't. But now the the, the, roost, the, the chickens are coming, the roosters are coming home to their roosts. The chickens are coming home to the roost. I guess they roost too. They're not roosters, though, are they? Interesting. But at any rate, they're all coming home, and, and it's coming to the point as good people are being violated this way. They're finding the ways they thought it was. They're finding the ways the lawyers thought it was to argue is failing. And the optimists that I send to be where we still got our fingers where we can get our fingers, and that includes you, my listeners, because you're listening to the same thing you could be doing uh, in order to out the fraud of the century, the historic errors that are going on to destroy your lives. 
Now, because the virus spreads, well, if we destroy that, there's no there's no evidence for a virus. And what they presumed was one was just a presumption of hearsay from another land who has a different standard as well. The standards of a lo- local jurisdiction for you, my dear Americans, is a certification and after an assessment of the existence of something. Cannot be hearsay. Has to be recorded. Everything's recorded in notice and objective basis here, not assumptions. Assumptions in a law decision. That is just an oxymoron I can't even get my head around. But anyway, relatedly to what? To what? The COVID or to the virus that you've allowed? Well, we read before, because the virus spreads, there are through close part- personal contact and through the air, does it? We actually found out it's not aerosol. It's aerosolized. It's actually droplet formed, and they just go to the extent that a droplet would go. It's not aerosolized. So it's wrong there. They make that statement without evidence and contrary to evidence. In fact, I don't know if I'd go this far on a habeas, but you may want to seed the conversation sentence by sentence, not long discussions, that it was erroneously, that your facts would be, that it was has been erroneously promoted that this is aerosolized. See, here's the point. You make that statement, they have to show how it was. Because the burden's not on you in a habeas, the burden's on the on the on the one who's unlaw- unwarrantedly restraining you. If you understand this dynamic, the restrictions have had substantial consequences for individuals and entire economies. There's your line that shows that they're agreeable at the Supreme Court in Oregon to allow a breach of their Article 10A in the in the response of this governor's fairy tale to cause economic and individual harm specifically prohibited in the Constitution. It is also unknown how long the consequences will last. Well, when you're dealing in a fairy tale, how long are the people going to believe in the fairy tale will be the extent to which this these consequences will last. Okay, there it is. We don't know. We're going to continue this thing as far as we can. We're going to give this governor the, all the power to kill you. Because she has, she, you'll see later on, I'm not going to get there. She is properly positioned as an as the official to do so. Is why, when you see that, why I'm saying you have to hit it for the fraud that it is. You can't properly position a fraud. They don't recognize that here. You're going to have to spell it out. How you do that is through the black and white requirements and obligations and duties of the local entities to make certified records recorded somewhere to prove the fact. If you don't mention those, you're going to lose again. It is unknown how long the consequences will last. Yeah, because it's unending, indefinite, your harm, until you say so. Why? Because the courts in Michigan said, told us, I think it was Wisconsin, maybe it was Wisconsin. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. There is a court out there that says, we're waiting for you to step up to ensure we're not harming you too much. Just as it is unknown how long it will be before the cure, there is a cure or vaccine. Uh, when you don't assert there's no test, you can't assert for COVID-19. First of all, there is no vaccine against symptoms. But if you're talking about the infectious agent, there is no test for how would there be why would you wait for a vaccine? Someone who waits for a vaccine on something you can't identify is mentally harmed. This whole court is mentally harmed. I said these people are abused. And they're putting their abuse on you. And you're allowing it. How much more do I want to go here, man? There's, just, we, there's so much importance in what is being said here. It's all crime. But how they go about dismantling your rights... Is, is really kind of fascinating in a way, and that people allow it. And they go through the discussion here. They actually tell you what I've said. They have the inherent power to check the excesses of other government agencies. They say it in this case. And then they evade the duty. Why? Because nobody came to expose there ain't no virus, folks. There ain't no test for a virus. The CDC's suggestion that there's a test is only for antibodies, not the infectious agent. And theirs is just a suggestion that does not displace the obligation and duty of the local public health authority to find the infectious agent. The test of which does not exist. How did you do it? 
How did the governor find this out on her own without it? She is a genius. She has done, she needs a Nobel Peace Prize. She's come up with a test that nobody recognizes and, and understands, no matter what they're training. Am I going a little bit hyperbolic here? Yes and no. These people are mental cases, and that is what's doing, controlling your lives, and you're allowing it, is the thing I'll get responding to. Anyway, this case is pretty interesting. It goes on and on about time. They always talk about how they're all in the law. In fact, the opening sentence tells you they're outside of their jurisdiction. The second sentence through it says they're doing an assumption when you know they don't have a proof because you know they have no test. Then where'd you get that? Not because you made it up. You got it because the CDC says the test they have, that RT-PCR and or the flow lateral flow test, only shows antibodies now or antibodies in the past. It does not do causation. does not find the infectious agent or the active agent in, in the, um, insult. How easy is that to figure out, folks, once you see it? I, I mean, really, it did take a little bit to get the coding down. It's not my field of study, but it certainly is affecting a lot of people. Ironically, not me. How do you figure that one out, folks? I'm looking for a place to jump in that's substantial. I can't find it yet. You got to have standing here. I'm really so much out of out of the out of the connection. I got no standing. There's nothing I do that this this imposition affects me. It, literally. Well, I actually just tangentially. There's something that just may have come up, but it's it's in a private property consideration. I'm not going to champion my position against a private property concern. That's not mine. That's what they want to do. That's what they want to do. I don't just will stop going there. It's pretty simple, right? So it did affect me, but I told you long ago when this came in, the two weeks ahead of the time of the, the people going in and routing out the toilet paper, I said, you better go get your sample. You better get the things you need for a couple months ahead of time before this happens. And you're going to have to deal with the stupidity in people's response instead of how they do principled reaction. That's still, in this case, what I'm dealing with. We're dealing with how people irrationally respond. Not something direct, and not something I have standing to do anything about. Literally, the government orders have no effect on so far on anything I've done. And that's not a lot of you, either. A lot of you are affected and have been. But anyway, I think, I think I'm going to slow up right here. I could go on, and I guess maybe it would be very valuable. I think it would be val very valuable. It would give you maybe some insight I think it's important. You don't kind of get from me what my insight is on how I apply what I do to see this stuff. And I think that might be valuable. Only, again, only to those that, that may want to do this. But there's so much more to see in here, just in the first two pages. But I'm a little concerned if I get into a subject area, I'm, gonna, I'm just not going to get to it. Uh, let me get to something. I'm going to go down to the third page now. I see. Uh, so, again, I read sometimes more than I think I do. But uh, So, in the third page, as the Supreme Court also stated in Jacobson, courts have the authority to intervene when political leaders attempting to protect the public against an epidemic act in, quote, an arbitrary and unreasonable manner or in a way that goes far beyond what is reasonably necessary. But as Justice Roberts recently observed, when political leaders undertake to act in areas fraught with medical and scientific uncertainties, their latitude must be especially broad. There's the license to your destruction. Did you hear me highlight uncertainties? Did you hear me highlight uncertainties? That's what you're taking away when you challenge the existence of the lack of certification to an infectious agent. That's what you attack when you show they can't find an infectious agent to be communicable. There is no uncertainty where there's no medical imposition. No medical or scientific authority exists, if you understand what that just says. This court agrees that you can challenge the epidemic action and isn't every act arbitrary and unreasonable where they don't have an identifiable infectious agent? Just as I've been telling you, you have to attack that no case. Please instruct me where this has been done different, where no attorney has asserted this very point at all. And on that, I need to again do another caveat, because I've said it before. Because you present this doesn't mean the corruption is so bad, the license is now so much given to themselves, 
to destroy you that the answer would be right. But once you bring out, I think, the clarity and common sense that there's no test, and people get to mull over this even for another six months if you were to do it today, and they realize, wait a minute, there was no test? Wait, wait a minute, they didn't, they made it up? Maybe, just maybe, the clarity of that public official record actually being out in the public would be enough to spur all you all to do what you actually need to do. And one of you can do that. One of you that's been affected can do this. This court case tells you all their standards, and I'm give, giving you, before I even read it, what you needed to say that would have truncated and eliminated their ability to bring all the things they brought to evade the actual law, evade the actual condition, which is nothing, no condition at all, and do this to you, and you sit at uh, uh, crickets. Uh, uh, it's really kind of, again, I don't even know what more to say. And so what happens? People start acting out. I need to get to this. Rural Oregon leaders mull revolt against COVID-19 reopening rules. So don't go do what I've been suggesting. And this is in a, not these people because these, these people don't know. Uh, we have some, a little bit of, little bit of influence a bit in an ear that listens that's back in this area. Uh, but they're not really wanting to pay attention. They don't understand. They want to make a convolution of it all. But now instead of doing what they ought to do, as I said, you don't Deny, defy, deny. Do not defy, deny. Deny what the reasons, that, like for this, I've been telling you. They now are characterized as revolt, being revolting, revolting against now a lawful order because the Supreme Court said so. Is the dynamic I'm trying to have you avoid so you don't walk yourself into this. This very thing where the people that are, have had it, the counties that have just had this thing, are now characterized as rev being in revolt is the same thing as defy because they're not stepping up to argue that the underlying infectious agent is not in the record as evidence. And they require, you require that into the definitions for a communicable disease. You require not the lip service given to a presumption of hearsay from a faraway land of, a, of existence of a novel coronavirus, but the actual evidence of its existence in record and filed for all y'all to see so that it's due process and notice to us of what they're focused on doing. Now, the extent of which may be then excessive, you can argue that, that's what you've heard some of the cases do, but that still gives the power, the corruption, corruptive force and power by way of a so-called judiciary, which is their members, or the bar members, remember, who are all of that membership, the bar association is an associate, is an agency of that state. It gives them the right to make private rule over you because you're not responding. And I, this is, I tell you, the COVID issue, this lack of test, is the answer we really needed to actually advance each one of us to stand up for ourselves, be responsible, don't get on our bike and ride to Chaz and see how much ass we can kick. That was donkeys. We're going to have donkeys over there, I heard. Yeah, okay. No, we have the right on our own uh, to protect ourselves. And not many of us, not any of you are. And it's disappointing, at least. But anyway, I'm glad to be able to try to give you some insight. Those of you that are working on this, keep pressing. Grimmer, thank you for what you do at reallibertymedia.com. Looks like I reached the end of the day. And Jules over at UCY.TV, thank you for what you do. It's simulcasting and, and uh, ignorant, uh, normalization of ignorance. Thank you for the rebroads and then uh, sim, uh, sound minds over at YouTube. Thank you for the uh, timely intervention and the chats over there. Appreciate everybody. And BitChute. Well, there's a bunch of BitChute stuff going on. The questions. Uh, I'm going to have to compile all that. I'm sorry. I forgot all about that. Just remember it right now at the end of the broadcast. I'll try and get to those questions for you, for you at BitChute. But I'll be with you next week. Tech Diffs or nature will. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, Journey with Purpose.
that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. <laughs>